Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you buy 2020 edition. Today we'll solve some problem. Actually, today we'll begin a new exam, a new test, test number nine, and we'll solve some problem. Problems beginning with page number 459. Always make sure the book is in front of you and do the work with me. You understand? Page number 459, number one. In the beginning, as you already know, the problems were very, very simple in the beginning, and then halfway through they get medium, and then towards the end, of course, they are more difficult. If at the end of the video you find this helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the exam, you can always get hold of me by sending me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at the very first one. The very first one we have two equations. We are told 2x minus y is equal to 8. And in the second equation we are told that x plus 2y is equal to 4. And the question simply is, what's the value of x plus y? That's what they want to find out. Let's find out, shall we? So, I see an 8 here, I see a 4 here. Why don't we multiply this equation by 2 so that we get an 8 here. If we have an 8 on this side, then whatever we see on this side must equal all of these things that we see here. Let's multiply the second equation by 2. And we end up with 2x plus, plus 4y equals 8. Don't confuse this much. This multiplication sign with this x here, let me put this without the multiplication sign, there we go. And now we have 8 on this side, and we have 8 on this side, which means that whatever we see here must equal that part. Let's start then. So 2x minus y must equal 2x plus 4y. 2x drops out as you can see, bring the y to that side and we'll end up with 5y is equal to 0, which implies that y must be equal to 0. If 5 times some, some quantity is 0, then obviously the quantity is 0. Now that we have the value of y, we can figure out the value of x from any of these equations. Let's use this equation here. So if y is equal to 0, we end up with 2x equal to 8, which means x is equal to 4. There we go, from the first equation. x is equal to 4, y is equal to 0, which means x plus y is 4. And that was it. Very simple, very straightforward. Number 2. And they usually are very simple and straightforward, at least the first few. Number two. Here, they simply want us to simplify. That's all it is. It says which of the following is equivalent to, and they give us different forms here, and we have to identify which one of the following is equivalent. So here's what's going on. You see, here we have two times some quantity, which is x squared minus x which happens to be the same quantity as this one, x squared minus x. So we have two of those and three of those, which means it's five, 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 five of those. Five of that quantity. And just open it. 5x squared minus 5x is the final answer. So that was number two. The answer is A. Number three. Number three says that we have an equation 2y we are told is equal to 2y minus 3x 2y minus 3x yep we are told equals negative 4 and all they want us to do in this equation all they want us to do in this problem is to identify the slope and the intercept in order for us to be easily identify the slope and the intercept we have to write it in, in the form of slope and intercept form equation because it makes it easier. It's, it's the safer route to go. The slope intercept form, as you know, is this. y is equal to mx plus b. In other words, let's solve this equation for y. So 2y equals, bring the 3x to the other side, 3x minus 4, divide the entire thing by 2, and y equals 3 over 2, x minus 4 over 2, which is just 2. Now, we're not interested exactly what the slope is. What we're interested in is only in the fact that the slope, slope is positive, and the y-intercept is negative. That's all they want to know. And just pick, pick the combination that fits that. Positive slope and negative y-intercept 
positive so negative that's answer choice D number four number four just make sure that you take your time to identify the right answer you don't want to get it wrong after having done all the work number four number four says that we start out he starts at 15 feet that's the original original height I was going to say altitude but here height is probably a better term which, which is of course same as saying that T naught at T naught that the height is 15 and then what happens then we are told then it rises at the rate at the rate of 8 feet per second and we simply want to and we simply have to come up with the equation so here if we were to describe height as a function of time height as a function of time what we find is that we're starting out at 15 that's our intercept that's our y-intercept when, when t is 0 and then after that each each one second that lapses we go up by 8 feet so it's just 8 times t where t represents the number of seconds that, that have lapsed the number of seconds that have lapsed and that's all it is and that's answer choice A the slope is 8 because we are going up 8 feet every second and we started at 15, second, uh, 15 feet so when t is equal to 0 t measures the number of seconds that have lapsed when t is 0 this thing is 0 and then we start at 15 number 5 number 5 says that we have a cause which looks like this so here's what's going on as always the questions that they give you they are very elaborate very verbose and they look they, they, they do their best they go out of their way to try to make it sound as intimidating as possible but usually there is not much in there so here they give you a long bloody story saying that two, two people hire an electrician they give the two people name and they, find, they tell you finally that, that in one person's case the electrician took two hours longer than the first person's case the question is how much more is the second person going to end up paying because the electrician took two hours longer than the, first, than the amount of time that he took at first person uh, what they're asking for is what is the cost of two hours what is the cost of two hours how much, how much do the last two hours cost how much how much for the last two hours from this equation so what does this tell you this one, 125 tells you that even when h is equal to 0 c equals 24 c is the cost what does this 125 tell you that tells us that the electrician charges the electrician charges 125 dollars just to show his pretty face just to show his pretty face just to show up at your house that's how it usually goes with, with electrician and plumber and so forth when you make a service call there is a there is a fixed amount that they charge you just to come to your house and presumably that's the that's the amount that we have to pay them for the time that they spend driving back and forth to your house and then after that the clock starts and in his case when the clock starts he's charging by 70 uh, he's charging at the rate of 75 dollars per hour so what happens then so he charges you 125 dollars when he shows up and then then he charges then charges 75 dollars per hour and therefore two hours is simply 100 we are making we are making such a big deal about something very simple the two hours are going to cost 150 dollars that's all Number six. And number six, we have a, we are told that we have an arc A D C. Arc A D C, which we are told has a length of five pi. So let's draw that arc here. So we have a circle here, and here let's call this A D and C. This the length of this arc we are told 
think to this arc we are told is 5 pi or rather 5 pi and we are told that this angle is x but then they go on to say that x equals 100 then they go on to tell us that x equals 100 so this is 100 degrees the question simply is what is the length of the arc length of arc A there must be B someplace I left it out bloody hell yes there is a B here somewhere the uh, length of arc A, B, C that's what it is the major arc is usually called the major arc and the minor arc they tell you the length of the minor arc is 5 pi was the length of the major arc it's very simple if this is 100 degrees then this guy must be 260 degrees because the all, all together it has to add up to 360 so just set it up as a proportion and solve it that's all it is just set it up as a proportion so we know 100 degrees we know 100 degrees has a length of 5 pi the question is was the length of the arc that uh, encompasses 260 degrees let's call it x and just solve for x that's what it is let's solve for x let's bring the x to the top here and we will have 2 pi times 260 over 100 that's all it is let's divide top and bottom by 2 0 drops out let's divide top and bottom by uh, I meant to say 0 Let, I meant to say 10 let's divide top and bottom by 10 and 0 drops out Let's, top it, let's divide top and bottom by, by uh, 2 and this will become 5 and that is not what I have in my answer something has gone wrong drastically 260 that went away 26 ah oh. I'm being silly here. Oh, it's a 5 pi. It's a 5 pi, not 2 pi. I wrote 2 pi first and I did it again. It's not 2 pi, it's 5 pi. I have 2 pi stuck in my head because of the circumference. Circumference is 2 pi r and it's just stuck in my head. The length of this arc is 5 pi. Which is why it wasn't making any sense. So let's start again. Divide top and bottom by, divide top and bottom by 10, the 0 drops out and then we have a 10 here, let's divide top and bottom by 5. If we divide top and bottom by 5, this 5 will drop out and this 10 will become 2. This 10 will become 2 and divide one more time by 2 and it will become 13. That's all. So it's 13 pi. Don't forget, don't forget this pi over. It's 13 pi. If you like, we can do it again because it's gotten so crowded and so messy. Let's start again. I'm going to do it without explanation. x equals 260 minus 260 times pi. Don't forget this pi at the end over 100. I don't know why I messed it up so badly. Let's divide top and bottom by that's a 5 pi here. I did it again. There is a 5 here. Let's divide top and bottom by 10. It goes away. Divide top and bottom by 10 becomes 2 and this 26 becomes 13. Well, 13 pi. The answer is 13 pi. Number 7. Number 7. Number 7 is very simple and very very silly. I don't even know why these questions are on the exam. They want you to find what x is. Just cross multiply, bring the x on the top, bring 160 on the bottom, so it become 8 over 160. Divide top and bottom by 8. 16 has, 16 has 2 8's and 0 has no 8's, so it's 1 over 20. The answer is 1 over 20. And since all the other answer choices are in whole number and there is only one number with a decimal, that's your, that's your guy, 0 .0, 0 0.05. Let's move on. Question number 8. If you came up with a fraction for the answer and all the other answer choices are whole number except one answer that has decimal, then obviously that's your answer. Number 8. Number 8 says no value of x satisfies 
the equation below. In other words, in a, that's another way of saying that the equation, the equation has no solution. The equation has no solution. We are further told that A is constant. A is constant in the equation that we are about to write. And the question simply is, what is the value of A? What is the value of A given the fact that it is constant and the equation that we are about to write, we are told, has no solution? Let's find out, shall we? The equation is like this. We are told that 2AX minus 15 equals 3 times x plus 5 plus 5 times x minus 1. I just have to pay attention. And it's better that I don't look at my notes because that way I don't mess up. Because if I keep looking at it, I get distracted. We're just going to do it together. Okay? Let's begin the story. So we'll have 3 times x is 3x. 3 times 5 is 15. And then we have 5 times x is 5x. And 5 times negative 1 is 5. There you go. And on this side we have 2ax minus 15. Oh. Well, let's continue. So we have 8x plus 10. 8x plus 10. And here we have 2ax minus 15. What we need to do here, well, what we are trying to do here is to find out the value of x. It says no value of x satisfies the equation. So what we are trying to figure out is what is it that causes uh, this equation to have no solution. In order for us to do that, we actually have to solve for x and see what happens what transpires, what occurs in the process that will cause us to have no solution. That's what we're trying to do. So what we're trying to do right now, something that I should have explained a few seconds ago, we are solving this equation for x. And if you're going to solve for x, we have to bring the term that has x in it. This term right here, 8x, we have to bring on this side. If you subtract subtract 8x from both sides, and 8x get here, gets here. And on this side, we have 10. And on this side, we have negative 15. Let's bring negative 15 on this side, it becomes positive 15. Are you with me? I'm going to pick up the story from here on the top so that it's easier to see. We're going to pick up this story on the top, right here. So first we see this has the x in it, this was the x in it, so let's bring the x common here. So we end up with 2a, 2a minus 8, x, x times 2a minus 8 equals 25, which means that x must equal 25 over 2a minus 8. Now we need some more room, so I'm going to erase all of this thing. You already have it. And now we'll see what it is that's going to cause what it is that's going to cause a problem. The problem that we're going to have is if if this bottom this, or if this bottom turns out to be zero, then x has no solution. Then x has no solution because it doesn't matter what we have on the top, it makes absolutely no difference what the numerator is because anything divided by zero is undefined. If the bottom becomes zero, this whole thing becomes undefined. It has no solution. So all we have to figure out is what value of a will make this thing zero. That's all it is. We just have to solve this quantity for a. Let's continue here. Let's continue here. So, if 2a is equal to 8, if a happens to be 4, voila, if a happens to be 4, this thing will have no solution at all. This, this thing will have no solution at all. Do you understand? That's all it is. And I'm going to show you why it will have no solution if you're curious. Okay. I'm going to show you. We need to erase this thing, obviously. You already have it. At one point in the story, when we were doing our work, at one point in the story, when we were doing our work, we were here. 2x minus 15 is equal to 8x plus 10. Just a, little, just a second ago. Watch what happens. Watch what happens if a is equal to 4. If a happens to be 4, 4 times 2 is 8. 8x minus 15 equals 8x plus 10. Oh, this is just stupid, because it's the same quantity, it's the same quantity, which means 
If I wanted to subtract 8x from both sides of the equation, we could do that. We could be allowed to subtract same quantity from both sides of the equation. Why not? And if we did that, look how silly it becomes. If we subtract 8x from both sides, we end up saying the negative 15 equals 10. It has no solution. The equation has no solution if A happens to be 4. It just degenerates into something insolvable. It has no solution. The A value of A can be anything other than 4 and we can solve for x. But if it is 4, then this quantity 8x becomes equal to this quantity 8x and it has no solution then. Number 9. Let's see what number 9 says. Oh, number 9 is... It says how many... How many solutions does the system of three equations as shown in graph have. So when something is written with the two dashes in there, that is same as putting a bracket around it. It's the same thing. And what that means is that if I were to take this out, the sentence should read smoothly. If you take this out, the sentence will still read smoothly, which will simply say, how many solutions does the system of how many solutions does the system of three equations have? That's all. As shown in the graph. So the graph that they're showing is this. The graph that they're showing is this. So first we have a parabola. Oh actually it is sitting right at the it is sitting right at the I was trying to go out of my way to, from, to make sure it doesn't sit on the y-axis. It turns out that the vertex is at y-axis. Let me just draw it one more time. So the vertex happens to be y-axis. And then they, they highlight these points where all these things happen as if, as if all of these things have significance. Because they are hoping that you will start counting the dots. They were hoping that you will start counting the dots. And then we have another line. Let's see, I just want to make sure that I don't, I don't muck it up. So on the line that goes something that something like this, it goes from here to here. And of course they have coordinates written out, but it doesn't matter how what the actual coordinates are, we really don't give an well, you seem sophisticated and worldly kind of person. You know you know bloody well what it is that we don't give, so I won't go there, okay? Just leave it at that. So you don't have to worry about what that is. Then there's another line. It goes like this. There we go. So they have this thing like this, this thing like that, that thing like this, this thing like this, this thing like this. What else? All sorts of things. All sorts of things there. Oh, and then the place where it where it cuts the where it cuts the x-axis here. All sorts of things. What we are looking for is that if we are looking for a solution to these three equations, and two of those equations have to be linear because they are straight line. And then the parabola, if you're looking for a solution to this three system of equations, we're looking for a place where all three of these come together, where one point where all three of them intersect. And that one point is right here. And that is the only point. That is the only point where three of them come together, and therefore this has only one solution. This, uh, the question is, how many solutions does a system of three equations have? The answer is just one. Just one. Voila. That's all there is. There's nothing to it. But I had to produce a picture so that we can see why there is one solution. All the other things that we see there is just for sure. So that was number nine. I think I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. We're going to pick up from number 10. We'll do 10, 11. We'll do 10, 11. Through 15 in the next video. Okay? I'll see you tomorrow. And as I said, we'll pick up from where we left off. Oh, if you want to get hold of me, as I said before, you can reach me at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Alright? Bye now.